Hey guys, welcome to yet another edition of Radio 815. I'm your host, my name is Marcelo Inestrosa, and welcome to episode number 11, entitled The Enemy Walks In. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the season 2 premiere of Alias Matt. You know what, I like this premiere, written by JJ, directed by Ken Olin. But I don't love it, to be honest with you, because a lot of it is bringing us up to speed on events that happened in the finale. So you can tell that ABC said to JJ, okay, you can have your premiere, but like, we still want people to find this show who didn't find it last year. And the DVDs weren't out when this premiered. So they were saying like, you know, try and find a way that if they skipped those 22 other episodes, they can find an in here. And we spent like quite a bit of time with Sydney talking to Patricia Wedding as a doctor, Dr. Barnett, who's evaluating her um, after everything that had gone on. And she recaps, you know, the stuff, the big stuff that happened at the end of last season, um, which is fine because there is still some really exciting sequences in this, you know, Sid has to plant a bug and she parachutes into the backyard of this party and she's got this bleach blonde hair and she's wearing this sexy dress and sneaks in to, to plant the bug. But we keep cutting to some of the events that happened previous. And I just wish that they didn't have to have such an in point because it felt like three quarters of a great episode and that other quarter felt like that episode Q and a where like, it was just, if we've already are up to date, it felt redundant. Yeah. I'm so glad that you uh, mentioned that this episode um, felt like Q and a, because when I started watching the episode, I did sort of get a clip show sort of, sort of vibe. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that I appreciated about this episode was um, the editing. I thought the editing was really, really interesting. Uh, mm. Specifically, um, when uh, when the episode kicks off and we find Jack, Sydney, and uh, Will on the plane, um, I, I can't remember exactly what Jack says, but he says something, and then and then and then it automatically cuts 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 to Sloan gi giving us. The answer that um, that I believe Sydney was looking for. Mm -hmm. So I really thought the editing and the music in this episode, for some reason, that really stood out to me. And I don't know what it was about the scenes uh, with Sydney and uh, the psychiatrist lady from the CIA, mm -hmm. but those scenes really um, they I I found them really intriguing to see Sydney sort of um, come to terms with everything that she's been through uh, uh, so far, you know, and and to come to terms with uh, the fact that her mother isn't who uh, she thought she was. And I feel that in this episode, we finally saw Sydney really break down and say, I'm not okay and I really need some help. Yeah, and that was great because she has has been through a lot. As we see at the top of the episode, she finally does meet her mom, this time played by Lena Olin, uh, who is married to Ken Olin at the time they made this, at least, um, who directed the episode, playing her mother, who she hasn't seen in forever. And the first thing that happens is they have that confrontation where her mother says, who sent you here? Tell me. And Sydney says, or what? I'm grounded? And her mom shoots her. Her mom shoots her. So like, you know, nice to see you, mom. She shoots her own daughter. And then, you know, Sydney breaks out and ends up escaping. Uh, and there's a great line of, you know, how did you, you got out of a chair and you escaped all this time? And she's like, yeah, if there's one thing I've learned during all of this, there's no drug like adrenaline. And I really like that. But it, like you said, we see that Sydney is having a difficult time dealing with the fallout from her mom because she literally for so long thought she was dead. Then she finds out she's bad. And Sydney has an, a, a great line 
that is basically her talking to the audience. But she says, all that anyone needs to know about that woman is that she's the bad guy. And that sums it up right there. But all of these years, Sydney didn't know that. It's still really hitting her as all of these layers are unfolding and, you know, kind of crushing her emotionally, which is why she does need those sessions with that doctor. I think that the scene with uh, Sydney giving the eulogy for Sloane's wife mm -hmm. uh, was really striking, really powerful to me because Sydney is sort of pouring out her heart about how Sloane's wife sort of took her mother's place, and in that, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and in that eulogy, she mentioned uh, an instance where Sloane's wife just asked her, just walked into the car after one evening at. Uh, after they had dinner at Sloane's house and something so simple as just walking someone to their car and asking them, you know, are you okay? And you, you and you want to know what? You're going to be okay. It's, mm -hmm. it's something so simple, but for someone who is struggling to find out who they are and for someone who has the feelings of abandonment by their father and by their mother, uh, that can mean so much. And I really... Uh, identify with that because I was sort of um, a baby left at the doorstep by my biological mother and my my, my biological mother wasn't in the picture for a while mm -hmm. but I uh, when I was younger I did deal with some of the same feelings that I saw Sydney exhibiting in this episode and it's for that reason above all that I really appreciated that uh, eulogy that Sydney gave at uh, Sloan's wife's funeral and another interesting point that I noticed during that episode, J.J. did a smart thing of cutting, of being tight on Sydney's face during that whole speech. Mm -hmm. But he, one or two times, he actually cut to Jack. Mm -hmm. And seeing uh, uh, Victor Garver react to uh, uh, his daughter's speech, for lack of a better word, was just sort of crushing to me. Yeah. You know? Uh, you, you you know you know you can say whatever you want about Jack. You can say he's a hard ass. You can say he sucks as a father, and by this point, he really does. <laughs> but it is nice to see those glimpses of a, a real father in there somewhere. As the series goes on, we will uh, see their relationship change. But it's nice to it's nice to see that uh, somewhere in the mind of Jack Bristol, he really cares for what he has put Sydney through in the past and moving forward here. Yeah, I agree. And I think that that whole giving Emily's eulogy scene is kind of like JJ doing what JJ does best, where he takes, you know, Sydney gives us an anecdote that humanizes her and just shows the power of being kind and human, but has deeper levels because we know that you know, she's giving this eulogy for a woman who is married to a bad guy. We cut to her father who can see the shades of disappointment and other things going on in Sydney's life. The subtext of that speech. But it really is just about the the humanity that a small moment can show and how big of a difference that can make in someone's life, whether you know it or not. And that's something that JJ, you know, is really good at infusing into scenes like that. Um, uh, one thing that I didn't necessarily like about this episode, uh, because it happens so often in season one that I wish that we were going to get away from it. They build a lot of tension at the beginning about Dixon turning Sydney into Sloan. Um, and then they just undo it all by Jack waving a magic Jack did it all wand. And, uh, of course it was Jack running a secret op. And, you know, don't worry about it. Sydney's not a double agent. That was the call sign I gave her. And there was like a bunch of times where Jack narrowly covered Sid's ass in season one. And again, we thought it was going to be this big moment. And then they just sort of say, no, we're not really interested. This is not the time for, for that. So they gloss over it. The thing they didn't gloss over is now that Will knows, we find out that Will... You know, because he got too close to SD6 and the whole conspiracy at the end of season one, now he knows about Sid. He knows about her double life. Um, all of that is on the table. So him and Sidney can have a better relationship, which I think is great. Uh, but the cost that Will has to pay 
you know, when they're on the plane, uh, they're coming up with cover stories for a bunch of stuff. And Sid says, what about Will? And Jack goes, well, you're going to have a hard time. And boy, does he ever. Because Will, in order to save his life, has to basically ruin his career. And that cover story of him being a junkie who wrote all these stories while high, you know, is a big sacrifice for a guy who in 22 episodes previous has been such a career oriented kind of guy. You know, the the main things we know about Will are he loves his career as a writer and he has unrequited love for Sydney. Those are like the two traits of the guy. So now we've taken one of those away in service of the other. You know, it's kind of interesting. And I really did like where, you know, Sydney gets a call in front of Will and he just says, you know, just say good guys or bad guys and I'll know what you're talking about. So now they have a code and they can have those scenes where Sydney can vent to someone in her inner circle about what's going on to add a little bit more of a, a different dynamic between the two of them. To uh, add more to your point, I did appreciate that Sydney in in that scene where Will when when, when they're at Sydney's house and and Sydney gets a phone call and and Will says good guys or bad guys just tell me and I'll understand. All throughout the course of that scene, we see that Sydney is feeling regret for mm-hmm. for for sort of putting Will in this unbelievably life changing situation. And I really like the way that Will Bradley Cooper's character reacts in that he may be feeling uh, feelings of anger, feelings of, of frustration for everything that he's gone through. But he does take the high road and he says, listen, I'm sitting here, I'm alive, and that is all thanks to you and Jack. Yeah. Because a lot of characters, when put in situations like that, will um, will rail up against the person right. who put them in a life-threatening situation. The fact that uh, JJ didn't JJ didn't do that with Will, I thought was very commendable. Yeah, big time, especially because, yeah, they really could have gone easily the other way and have Will be angry and annoyed and blame Sydney and Jack for this situation that he's in, and they don't do that, which is great because I, I want to like Will, so I, I'm glad they didn't do that. The other main thing in this episode is that Vaughn has been missing. And when Sydney does bug that telephone, she ends up finding Vaughn. Um, she gives him a needle of adrenaline to the heart, Pulp Fiction style, saves his life. And then, um, you know, she's relieved that that has happened and he's going to be okay. But then she goes and crashes a mission um, where they're making an exchange of a briefcase and the whole thing gets blown up by a shooter who ends up being Irina and Sydney is standing there with Cass and now the other big bad and Irina kills the other big bad and spares Sydney. Um, and the two share a really powerful moment just sort of looking at each other, you know, Sydney kind of still reeling from the fact that her mom is alive and a bad guy and a little bit more going on than arena has showed us to that point without saying a word she disappears and then we sort of cut to this whole thing where sydney is telling the the doctor you know if you haven't heard they had a walk-in at the cia today and it was my mother (laughs) she wants to surrender and I'm not sure this is a problem I know how to handle, which is commendable that Sydney is flat out saying, like, I do not have the skill set to to tackle this right now. And it does open a door of intrigue. You know, Sydney's mom wants to surrender and defect to the CIA. Can she be trusted? And how is she going to earn back that trust if that's possible? I do think that JJ did an excellent job. Um, in this episode, or should I say, Jennifer Gardner did an excellent job acting in this episode. Acting in this episode about showing her apprehension towards the way that she actually feels about her mom. You know, mm-hmm. because you can see her uh, all throughout the course of this episode trying to figure out why her mom is the way that she is. Right. You know, and 
I love the fact that all throughout the course of this episode, uh, up until the very end, it's like Sydney really doesn't come to a conclusion um, as to how she feels about her mom being a quote unquote bad guy. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciate that. Also, I really love the way that her mom was introduced in this episode. Yeah. In the fact that uh, this episode starts off with uh, very similar to the pilot. You know, Sydney is trapped, strapped yep. in a chair, wearing some sexy clothing, and uh, she gets shot. You know? I mean, mm. you know, if that's not a bomb way to introduce a character, I don't know what is. Right. Um, you know, but I also love the fact that when they had that last standoff in the warehouse, after her mother dispatches of the other big bad, she says that uh, after she asked Sydney to take the prone position, she says that uh, very softly, she says, you know, uh, I, I believe she says something like, you don't know the truth. So mm. she gives Sydney a monicum of hope there. And I did appreciate that. Um, in spades. The other thing that I particularly didn't like and I was kind of confused about mm-hmm. was I wasn't really sure if Dixon well, I I sort of knew that he knew that Sydney was a double agent, but I, I I wasn't really sure on how he felt about that. So when JJ did that misdirect, you know, where where we thought, you know, uh Dixon had sold out Sydney to Sloan. Mm-hmm. I was, I, you know, you know, I was, I was terrified because I'm like, what, you know, do you, do you believe her or, or, or you know, are you her friend or are you just a right. backstabbing prick, you know? Yeah. So that, that sequence by JJ and that big fake out that he set up really was effective. It, you know, you know, it, at least for me, because I still had that, that lingering question was, you know, does he really know and, you know, and does he really believe her or is he trying to still figure it out and work it out in his head? So that right. would, so that was very effective to me. Yeah. And, you know, the thing we didn't know at the end of the finale last year was, was Dixon's allegiance to Sydney greater than his allegiance to SD6. And as him turning her in shows, he still, you know, he loves Sydney, but he still thinks SD six comes above, above her sort of, you know, because he did turn her in, but now, you know, where do they go from here? Will be interesting to see for sure. And there was a creepy, I do just want to, since we're talking about SD six after that whole, like Dixon thing gets smoothed over Sloan, when he is talking to Sydney, he takes credit for, you know, I'm going to let Will live as a, a gift to you because you've been through so much and he like rubs her shoulders and he's trying to be like fatherly, but because it's Sloan, it just came off as creepy. I really love the way that JJ decided to frame that shot mm-hmm. because it was like, it was like he, he framed it as to say, okay, this is the devil over her shoulder. Totally. Yeah. You know, and all to, 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 to expand on your point further, all throughout him saying that speech and all throughout him taking credit for not killing uh, Will, I wanted to smack him in the face. Yeah, oh yeah. As we know he wanted to kill Will. It was only because Jack found a way to make it possible. Right, right. And, you know, I, 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 know, I know it's a long way off, but when Sloan finally gets his comeuppance in years to come, I will be the happiest camper on the planet or the happiest camper as a part of this podcast when Sloan gets it. For sure. Uh, so, yeah. Um, with all that being said, uh, what would you give this episode, uh, uh, this first, uh, season two episode of Felicity Matt on a scale of one to 10? What would you give it? So I think for me, the enemy walks in, is kind of like a 6.5 to a seven. Cause like I said, I liked it, but you know, I rated the, the pilot super high and this, while exciting, didn't quite get all the way there for me, especially knowing that there's like a lot of really exciting stuff coming up in the season. This just barely set the table enough for me. Well, I'm on the same wavelength that you are. I thought this episode did a nice job of re- uh, of reintroducing us to the world of of Alias, but you know, I, I felt uh, I felt that this episode had a lot of clip show 
elements to it. And I really didn't appreciate that because I had seen most of season one and, and I was already in for the ride. This episode to, 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 to bring back one of your points was like an episode that JJ made to sort of draw new people in, you it know, was. yeah. this episode wasn't built for people who are already sold on alias as a mission impossible slash an Indiana Jones adventure show. Right. You know? So I, I think if he would have, if he would have not listened to the network big wigs and really, and really crafted the episode that he wanted, uh, you know, it would have been a little bit different and a little bit better. With all that being <coughs> said, I would give um, this first episode of season two of Alias, I would give it a four. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I did think that there were some good things in it, but it, 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 it could have been so much better if he would have taken out the cliff show elements of this episode. And one more quick note before we wrap up here. I did like that uh, Greg Br- Greg Grumberg did the previously on segment. Yep. And I did like that he had a bigger role in this um, episode. Although I don't know if he still, I don't know if he made it out or not because I don't remember. So I'm going to have to, I'm gonna have yeah, to do- basically Weiss, uh, you know, now that he wasn't doing, cause this was the first season after Felicity ended. Um, he was available full time if they needed him. They didn't use him full time, but they gave him a bit more to do. And to your point, though, about the way that this episode feels because it tries to bring everyone up to speed, it it makes this kind of episode actually a bit of a relic because nowadays, even on a super heavy serialized show, they don't do a premiere like this because they just assume that you'll be watching it on a Netflix or something. And before the episode even starts, they'll have the previous season recap that you can watch or skip so you don't have to have an episode like this because in the age of streaming and you know binge watching nobody needs it anymore they they just don't do them do do you think that if this show was made today it would do a lot better let's say like on a streaming service like um a netflix a netflix or an amazon prime do you think that this show would have uh, garnered bigger numbers. Yeah, and I still even think all of these kind of shows can find a new audience because they are so serialized. This is the kind of show people love to binge. With all that being said, that'll do it um, for our review of um, Alias Season 2 entitled uh, The Enemy Walks In. Um, if you guys have anything to say about this episode or alias in general, or you want to talk to us about uh, some of the other works that JJ has done. If you want to ask us when the hell we're going to get to lost, uh, (laughs) you can reach out to us on Twitter by using the hashtag radio eight one five. So Matt, if, uh, if the listeners want to reach out to you and talk to you about anything, where can they reach you? Best spot is on Twitter at Matt Crandall. Uh, Yeah, with that being said, if you guys want to talk to me about anything, you guys can reach out to me on Twitter at CreekFanatic88. So with all that being said, for my co-host Matt Crandall, I am Marcelo Nostroza saying we'll talk back soon.